maybe what I'll do before uh, before I jump right in um, to, to the work that we're doing is kind of uh, take a second to describe what the Agricultural Experiment Station is. Um, we were founded in 1875, uh, and the, the idea behind uh, the Agricultural Experiment Station system in the United States is to have um, uh, you know, technically trained scientists who would interact directly with growers. Um, the, our, our founder, Samuel Johnson, actually uh, modeled the system off of one that was in Germany at the time. Um, so we were the first experiment station that was formed in the United States. Uh, every state uh, in the U.S. does have an agricultural experiment station, but Connecticut's a little a little odd because the original statute that that um, we were formed under actually said we had to be, be an independent uh, state agency. So every other ag experiment station in the other 49 states are actually parts of the Department of Agriculture, or excuse me, parts of um, the land grant university system. So all of my colleagues as directors are actually deans of colleges of agriculture. Um, so in Connecticut, we're, we're actually a state agency. So we're more, uh, you can think of us as a, a kind of research institute, uh, which influences some of the things that we do. Uh, so today, what I wanted to describe was some of the work that we've been doing on, on nanotechnology uh, in agriculture, and specifically how we think we can use that to sustainably uh, achieve global food, uh, food security. Let's see here. My slide is not advancing. Try it this way. Okay, gotta do it that way. Um, so I, I think the best way to think of this is to, to kind of, um, you know, start at the beginning of, of the story of agricultural productivity. And we do know that over the last five decades, um, productivity has increased dramatically from the Green Revolution through wide scale irrigation and use of agrochemicals. Uh, but we also know we still have significant shortcomings. And we laid out some of those shortcomings in this Nature Nanotechnology paper, which we published uh, in 2019. Uh, and we actually got the cover, which was, was pretty exciting. Um, and, and this is some of the shortcomings that we still, ha still have. For example, this is data looking at um, the year over year productivity. Uh, we're showing just four crops, but we had data for 11. Uh, the orange bars here represent the 1975 to 1984 period, whereas the blue bars are, are the more recent 2005 to 2014. Now, these are still these are year over year increases. Uh, but what you see is that um, the, the magnitude of the increase in productivity each year is steadily declining. Uh, and again, we've got this data for 11 crops, but essentially meaning we're becoming less efficient at producing food. Uh, we also know we have significant problems with chronic hunger, 800 million people globally, uh, and micronutrient deficiencies or hidden hunger, 2, million, 2 billion people are suffering from that. Um, then we have this concept of, of yield potential, which is essentially the amount of productivity uh, estimated or calculated um, that a piece of land could produce. At best, we achieve 80%, uh, and in many cases, we're well below that. Uh, and then the piece of the pie here that we've chosen to spend a lot of time on is, is agrochemical efficiency. Um, the, the efficiency by which pesticides and fertilizers are delivered to crops uh, is anywhere from 1% to 25%, meaning 99 to 75% of the time we're missing the target. And there's some pretty big implications to that. Uh, and we know from nanomedicine that nanotechnology can be used under certain circumstances to, to really um, enhance targeted delivery. Uh, but this is, this is the big driver, obviously. And this is not new. We've known this for some time that, that um, the population that we're going to have in 2050, we're going to have to increase food production by 70 to, to 100 percent. And remember the data that we were just looking at, we're actually moving in the wrong direction. So we're going to have to turn that around and we're going to have to turn it around in the, in the face of significant negative pressure from a changing climate, a loss of arable soil, things like COVID. Uh, in Connecticut, for example, in the year 2021, uh, the state actually received the average amount of rainfall that we're supposed to receive, but it was at completely different times of year. We had the hottest April and May on record and the wettest July and August. Uh, and that really, really uh, complicated things for growers here. Um, so many of us have really come to this, uh, this conclusion that we, we're going to need to revolutionize how we produce, uh, store, and distribute food uh, on this planet. Uh, and we really think nanotechnology can play a big part uh, of this. I'll focus a lot today on uh, agrochemical inefficiencies, but there are other pieces to this as well that we and, and many other groups are working on. 
So nanotechnology in agriculture is not, not a new concept. If you do a web of science search, you can find some review articles all the way back to 2002, 2003. Uh, and the approach is pretty straightforward. You know, can we use nanotechnology to produce more food more quickly using less energy and water and minimizing waste produced or helping us uh, remediate the waste that's produced? Uh, and essentially just put nano in front of any agrochemical uh, application. Uh, or approach and, and you've, you've got a strategy. Uh, these are just some of the papers that my group and others have, have published over, over the years uh, on this topic. Uh, so in terms of research at the experiment station, uh, there's actually two kind of separate um, strategies we're looking at here. Uh, and as Doug mentioned in the introduction, actually, <clears throat> the, the more mature part of this uh, is, is uh, looking at the implications of nanotechnology and, and, and nanotoxicology. My PhD is in environmental toxicology. Uh, so when I started hearing about engineered nanomaterials, you know, in 2004, 2005, I really kind of viewed these as the next emerging contaminants, you know, the next DDT, the next PFAS. Uh, and I set up a research program looking at how these materials were going to negatively impact plants, specifically agricultural crops. And many of, many of these questions we're actually still looking at, uh, and I still got a postdoc or two working in this area, <clears throat> but what we discovered after a couple of years was not only were there certain instances where these materials were not toxic to plants, but they were actually causing, they were, they were enabling benefits. Uh, and we set up this kind of parallel research program where we're looking at the applications. Uh, and this has, has now become a much larger program in my group and in terms of collaborations. Uh, these are some of the questions that we're addressing and I'll, I'll go through these today. Much of the work's uh, funded by the USDA, uh, although I'm involved in two separate centers, one from the, the National Science Foundation in the US and the others uh, actually just ending uh, in a month or two, uh, but it was funded by Nanyang Technological University through Harvard, where I have uh, had an appointment for a while. So our first uh, foray into this nano-enabled agriculture area um, started in about 2014, where, when I started talking to a plant pathologist here. Um, and <clears throat> he was working on soil-borne diseases. These are really difficult diseases to, to address. Uh, and, you know, in the bad old days, we would fumigate soils to get rid of soil barn pathogens, but we don't do that anymore. And you pick a crop and you're going to lose 20% of it to soil borne disease, whether it's fungi, uh, nematodes or something else. Uh, in the U.S. alone, we're looking at uh, a loss of economic return of 200 million uh, in spite of the 600 million we're spending on fungicides. Uh, as a toxicologist, I know fungicides are the most toxic group of, of pesticides we use. Uh, I tend to not think of this in terms of money. I tend to think of it in terms of food that we're losing right now. So we know that many micronutrients, things like copper, manganese, zinc, there's 11 or 12 we could put here. They're part of plant defensive systems, plant response to abiotic or biotic stress. But we know these nutrients have very limited availability in soil. For soil chemistry reasons, we don't need to go go into, but we know when we add them to soil, they rapidly become unavailable to the plant. And we also know that when we apply them as a foliar uh, material, um, most of them are not translocated to the roots. Uh, and the roots are where we need them if we're talking about soil borne pathogens that are infecting through that, through that tissue. Um, plants just evolved to, to do the opposite. They evolved uh, pathways to take nutrients from the soil and send them to the shoots, not necessarily to go in the opposite direction. So we asked the very simple question, well, what if, what if we started using nanoscale versions of these micronutrients? Would they be more effective at enhancing nutrition? Um, so what we'd like to point out here is, although we are specifically attacking pathogen activity, plant diseases, we are not directly targeting the pathogens. There are people that do that, uh, but what we're actually looking at is seeing if we can enhance and modulate plant nutrition so the plant can defend itself. Uh, and as you might suspect, we've actually had quite a bit of success at this. So this was our first paper we had in this area. It was published in 2016 on uh, Environmental Science Nano. Very straightforward ap approach. We did greenhouse and field trials. Uh, the disease systems my pathologist colleague had uh, and still has, uh, in, you know, uh, where eggplant and tomato were two of the good ones. Uh, we evaluated commercially available nanoparticles uh, of copper, manganese, and zinc. Our, our approach is also fairly unique. Uh, so we do a foliar application. Uh, and in this case, it's 100 milligrams per liter, but it's a foliar application, either a dip as a, or a spray to a very young seedling. 
So even though it's 100 ppm, we're actually only adding one to two milliliters of that solution. So the amount of added nutrient uh, or material or metal oxide, however you want to think about it, is actually very low. Uh, and then we do the transplant either to infested soil uh, in a greenhouse or, or to the field. Uh, and that's it. That's the only treatment uh, that we do. Uh, so we compared that to the conventional bulk and salt forms. Uh, this is the data over here on the right. It's probably too much um, to handle, but the, the green bars represent the the copper. Uh, the middle green bar represents the nanoscale version. And what you see is this is field data for eggplant. So this is the number of fruit per, per plant. Uh, you see a statistically significant increase in yield. This is a measure of disease. So the higher the bar, the lower the, um, the higher the bar, the greater the disease. So you see a significant suppression of disease with the nanoscale copper. Uh, and then this is ICP of the roots. We're getting increased copper in the root tissue. So this, this hypothesis of foliar application to stimulate plant response seems to, seems to hold. Uh, and when you do the in, in vitro assays for the amount of material that we're adding, because I said, as, as I said, it's quite low, um, this amount of copper is not even toxic to, to a fusarium in this case. This is a fungal pathogen, I should have mentioned. Now, because this is a field study, we could do some calculations. Uh, so we actually spent $44 per acre on nanoscale copper oxide. Uh, and what did we actually do? We just took a nutrient that the plant needs and can't get enough of, and we just supplied it in a unique form, a nanoscale form. So that $44 investment in that nutrient gave us about a $10,000 uh, increase in yield per acre, or as I like to about, think about it, a significant increase in food production. So we did some follow-up studies. This was published in Plant Disease in, in uh, 2018, where we started trying to understand the molecular mechanisms for what was happening. So this is another experiment with fusarium. We switched to watermelon. Uh, here are watermelon seedlings with a, a, a nasty case of fusarium. Um, sorry, they die pretty quickly. This is the nanoscale foliar treatment. So the approach was uh, very similar, a one to two milliliter um, foliar application of a couple of hundred ppm. In this case, we did 100 and 1,000 ppm. We looked at a whole range of different micronutrients. Uh, so here is disease progress. So again, there's your control, your high amount of disease in that red bar. I'm hoping you can see my cursor. Um, and then this is biomass. So this is just a greenhouse study. And again, what we found is several of the micronutrients did slow disease, but it was really only copper in nanoscale form that both significantly suppressed disease, but also increased biomass. But as I mentioned, this was our first molecular biology attempt. So um, we looked in the root system uh, at, a, at five or six specific genes, and we found two of them that were related to plant defense, polyphenol oxidase and plant, uh, PRP1. In the roots, were these genes were significantly upregulated if both the pathogen and the nanoscale copper in the foliar application was present. So again, it really looks like we're stimulating this plant defense. Uh, so at this point, I actually had joined uh, the NSF Center for Sustainable Nanotechnology. Uh, so these NF NSF centers are quite large. Um, we're in year eight of this. They run for 13 years, uh, you, although you have to do renewals at, at three and uh, five and um, to, um, to, to get the, the continued funding. Uh, but this is a better part of $40 million. Uh, and there are 11 universities. We've got, I think, 50 graduate students and postdocs working on it. Um, so the, the nano-enabled agriculture part of the center is relatively small. Uh, but here, it's a chemistry center. So we're focusing on the material, the concept of can you tune the properties of that material, of that copper, during synthesis uh, to produce different morphologies, different behaviors, and then um, optimize your impact on your system? Uh, and the answer is yes. So um, this was a paper we published in 2018 where we compared commercial copper oxide, which we were just looking at, to a custom synthesized material um, that were copper phosphate nano sheets. So we changed both the composition by including phosphate uh, and the morphology uh, by making a sheet instead of a sphere. This changes dissolution profile. It changes a whole range of par uh, parameters. Uh, so this is watermelon. Uh, and again, this is uh, field data. Um, and what you see is here's disease, um, AUDPC. So we evaluated foliar applications of 10 to 1,000 ppm. The yellow bars here are the commercial material. And similar to the previous two studies, you got to get up to a couple of hundred ppm, again, one or two milliliters of volume, but a couple of hundred ppm to start to see a, uh, a decrease in disease or down here, the yellow bar is an increase in biomass. But when you use the custom material, so you know we've tuned the chemistry um, to maximize the effect, you're actually seeing significant 
significant suppression of disease at 10 ppm, significant increase of biomass at 10 ppm. Uh, and, um, you know, that ability to, to achieve that effect at a tenfold lower dose is really, um, you know, an effective way to, to do this if you're concerned about managing risk, which is, you know, toxicologists we are. So this was a paper we published at the end of 2020. Um, we switched systems. We went with soybean, which is obviously a higher commodity crop, uh, and sudden death syndrome, um, which is a fungal pathogen. Uh, and we really delved into the, the molecular biology here to try and figure out the mechanism. So we got the cover of Nature Nano again, which is uh, always very exciting. Uh, so in our, this is just greenhouse studies, but in our, uh, in our um, disease controls, you're seeing 60 to 70% reduction uh, in biomass and photosynthesis, all sorts of antioxidative um, damage. Uh, and our foliar application, again, one to two milliliters, two seedlings that are one or two weeks old, we're able to alleviate much of this damage that, that's occurring. Uh, but as noted, we really went into the mechanisms here. We looked at over two dozen genes related to defense and health. Uh, and we were able to correlate the, the benefits that we were seeing in the plant with the upregulation of, of all of these different pathways of nutrition and biotic defense. Uh, and importantly, we were able to correlate some of the properties of our materials, of our specific materials to the magnitude of effect. And what really got us into nature nanotechnology was we were able to computationally describe and predict uh, some of that because our center has some computational chemists in it. Uh, so this was, this was a really good study for us. Um, this is a paper that was just published. One of the questions uh, that you have to ask is, you know, we're applying this, we're still working on copper here, these materials to the leaf surface, how are they getting in? Because we're applying it to the leaf, but we want the material in the roots. Uh, so we took a step back and started using some Arabidopsis mutants uh, that we that we acquired that were uh, had differences in either stomatal activity, which is one way material will get in through the stomata. Uh, or the cuticle, which would be another way on uh, diffusion through that. So we had increased stomatal activity mutants and decreased ones, uh, increased cuticle thickness and decreased ones or compromised integrity. Uh, so we applied copper uh, and then we tracked it from 15 minutes after application to eight hours. And we looked at copper in different fractions. So the copper that we could, that we could remove with the just simple rinsing, we called that the, the removable fraction. Then we came up with a technique where we could actually just extract just the cuticle, nothing else. So then that was the cuticular fraction uh, and then the whole leaf fraction. So we observed some interesting things. The, the most interesting to me, at least, was copper in conventional form, sevenfold more of that copper when you apply it to the leaf, sevenfold more of that copper actually gets stuck in the cuticle over eight hours and it doesn't make it into the leaf relative to the nanoscale forms. And this is important because this is your conventional uh, form of copper that's used in agriculture, or at least a, a version of it. Uh, in terms of pathways of entry, the cuticle was irrelevant. Um, if with our decreased cuticle mutants, what you would predict is more copper if the, if the cuticle was important because there's less cuticle, we didn't see that. It was all in the stomata. In our increased stomata mutants, we had increased copper making it into the leaf to the interior fractions. With the decreased stomata mutants, we had less copper. Uh, and then the increased stomata mutants, when we shut those stomata with a basisic acid, that shut down that increase that we saw in copper uptake. So it's really the stomata that's important, uh, which is good to to know because you know the leaf surface depending on the species is only you know one to ten percent stomata but there's a specific chemistry associated with those stomata and you can you can target that chemistry and maximize it in terms of applying your materials so everything up until now was on copper. Some of the other materials we're working with in the center, uh, one is silicon, specifically mesoporous silica. This is a paper we published in 2019 uh, on um, watermelon uh, and fusarium. Uh, and in this case, the mesoporous silica that the PhD student made at the Minis uh, University of Minnesota uh, was coated with chitosan. So we did both a traditional foliar application that we're talking about here, but also a seed treatment. Uh, and when we looked at the seed treatment, sure enough, you know, you get a seven to 20% increase in the silicon content of that treated seed that increases germination and suppresses disease, whether you're um, 
just looking at a, you know, the germination rate or whether you're doing a greenhouse study, which is what we did. But what was interesting is many of the genes that we were tracking for copper that we were showing were all being upregulated because we were stimulating plant defense. In the case of silicon, they're all downregulated. Uh, and that's what you see here. And that's because it's a different mechanism. That's because in this case, what the, the mesoporous silica was actually stimulating was greater deposition of root cell wall material. So we're actually increasing the barrier of defense so of course the plant is actually less stressed, even though the you know the pathogen's still there. It's just less pathogens getting in because you've increased uh, the barrier. And again, um, I'm not mentioning this as a, as much as I probably should, but we always have the non nanoscale or the conventional tr controls. And and many of these things that we're seeing here, many of these enhancements are really a function of the nanoscale properties of the material. Uh, so this had a field component to it, uh, and, and uh, one of the things that happens in this type of work is something that works in the greenhouse completely falls apart in the field, and that's what we saw here. This is actual watermelon yield of fruit. Uh, all, our treatments had no, no impact in the field in the disease condition, but what was interesting is in the healthy condition, because remember this is a required nutrient, uh, our, our chitis encoded mesoporous silica actually increased yield by 70%. Uh, so that's a, uh, an investment of $19 per acre, again, for a nutrient that the plant needs and just can't get enough of. And we're producing 20,000 more pounds of food or $8,000, $7,000 per acre, uh, if you want to think about it that way. Um, so still sticking with the chemistry, one of the questions is we're, we're, we're applying these materials to the leaf surface. Um, and, but nanoparticles themselves are useless to plants. I mean, what the, the metabolically active form of all of these nutrients is the ion. That's, that's what's incorporated into the, in the metabolic processes. So dissolution is, is important here. So this was a study we published in 2021 where the PhD student actually made different versions of silica. Uh, they had the same, um, you know, relief, they had the same uh, charge, same size, but all they differed was the, the rate at which they released silicic acid, which is the usable nutrient. Uh, so again, this concept of tunable chemistry, uh, we're controlling the dissolution rate. Uh, and that's what you see down here, so silicic acid dissolution um, coming off these uh, five different types of particles. Uh, so then, you know, we went into back. So once we had these materials, we did a plant study. And this, again, there's too much data on here. Uh, but this is, this is field data. And what we demonstrated that the materials that worked the best uh, were the ones that dissolved the most quickly, the ones that released the most silicic acid um, over the shortest period of time gave us our 34% uh, increase. Um, that should be increased, sorry there. Um, so, uh, so what, what we did was, well, we thought this was great. We wrote it up, we submitted it to environmental science and technology. And, um, you know, one of the reviewers came back and basically said, well, if the fastest releasing particle is the most important, you know, why not just add silicic acid? And this was a case where we actually hadn't run that control. So we went back, we ran the silicic acid, and sure enough, if you just add the ionic form, the silicic acid, there's actually no benefit at all to the plant. Uh, so it really has to be in this nanoscale form. Something, something about that's very important. Uh, so this is a paper we published in one of the other centers. This was published in 2020. Um, and again, this is funded through Nanyang Technological University through Harvard, where I had an appointment. So I was able to get a, kind of a sub award to run a project where we looked at seed treatments. Uh, and seed treatments are nothing new. Um, there's plenty of these used, but our, our assessment of this was many of the current platforms were actually um, not incredibly versatile uh, or effective. So our concept here, and we're actually still pursuing this, we're about, um, about to put in a USDA grant on this, um, was to, to come up with seed coatings that are biodegradable, they're biopolymer based, but we're going to use electro spinning. So we're going to, we're going to get these nanoscale fibers that we can lay down onto seeds. Uh, and that's the carrier. So then we can put stuff in that carrier, those nanoscale biopolymers, uh, going after, you know, the three R's to get the nutrient to the right place at the right time at the right dose. Uh, so we investigated this under uh, healthy and disease conditions in lettuce and tomato. 
this is just glossing over a lot of the chemistry. The postdoc working on this spent about a year, um, you know, coming up with uh, the, the, these fibers. But the point here is, it's, again, it's the tunability that, that, that's really driving this. You can control the ratio of different polymers, whether a surfactant's present, what the concentration of the surfactant is, and you can get nanoscale fibers with different properties. In this case, our cargo, cargo was just simple copper ions. Uh, we didn't we didn't use nanoscale copper because there was no need to. The nanoscale comp form comes in the carrier, the fibers. But by controlling the chemistry, we're able to control the release rate of this nutrient. So there's your tunability. So we in this initial study, we had fast release, slow release, and then double layer, fast on the outside, slow release of copper on the inside. This is just data showing the time to germination. So you want more rapid germination in this case, a decreased time to germination. Uh, again, a, a busy slide, but here's our healthy uh, lettuce and tomato on top, the diseased lettuce and tomato on the bottom. Uh, with this type of study, you have all sorts of controls, the, you know, the polymers uh, with, with or without the copper. Uh, and then we also tested two conventional polymers, uh, which in this case, uh, in the case of the healthy tomato, are actually increasing the time to germination. But the green bars represent our treatments, fast, slow, and, and the double layer. Uh, and what you see uh, in the tomato and the trend was there in the lettuce was a, a significant de decrease in the amount of time to germination. Uh, and then when you looked over here uh, under the disease condition, well, the first thing you see is the presence of the pathogen adds a day or two to germination. Uh, but again, you know, our, our polymers over here are significantly overcoming the, those delays from the pathogen. Uh, and I'm not going to take the time to show you the biomass. This was a 15-day study, but more rapid germination led to larger plants, which presumably would lead to larger yield, uh, which we want to explore. So this was a paper we published uh, in 2020. Uh, and it was uh, in collaboration um, with a group at UMass, Amherst, uh, and uh, Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Uh, and this is interesting because this is the first attempt to combine two materials that we're interested in. Obviously, we have a long history with copper, but we also began to get interested in sulfur for different reasons, uh, because it is a nutrient. It's part of the glutathione system in plants, which is critical to biotic defense and abiotic defense. Uh, and in this case, the, the PhD student made copper sulfide net particles. And again, sticking with this, this concept of tunable chemistry, uh, worked at different ratios of the two. So we worked with rice uh, and uh, the fungal pathogen that causes Bacane disease. Uh, we did a greenhouse study. We did foliar and seed applications uh, for, for 21 days and measured a, a whole range of endpoints. Uh, for this, I'll just show you the, the disease incidence data, which is over here. So here is the seed treatment data and then the foliar application. And interestingly, it was the seed treatment that really worked here. So here's our healthy um, control, the green bar here, very low disease. The blue bar, the pathogens there, we get lots of disease occurring. And what you see here are the nanoscale treatments. And these two, the gray and the kind of orange bar here are our two copper sulfides. So they're significantly suppressing disease to a greater extent than regular copper oxide uh, nanoparticles. Uh, but this large blue bar is actually coside, which is a conventional fungicide. Now it's not listed for seed treatment, uh, but we're still significantly outperforming um, you know, a conventional fungicide. Uh, the foliar application didn't work quite as well, but our one material is still, still suppressing disease. But the nice thing about a seed treatment is you're actually adding even less material than you are when a foliar application. In terms of mechanism, uh, there's probably a couple of things going on. We already know all of the things that copper is doing. We also know that sulfur is important in plant secondary metabolism, as I said, glutathione. But we, we did some microscopy and we also saw uh, nanoparticles in, in the shoots. So we're, we're probably getting some direct antimicrobial effect here as well. So that's when we really started getting interesting and interested in sulfur. And we submitted a proposal just on nanoscale sulfur to USDA. Uh, and it was funded in, in the middle of 2021. We just finished our, our first year. Uh, and this was the first paper that was published out of that new project. It was actually with uh, our, our collaborators in, uh, in China. Uh, and uh, it was published in ACS Nano. Uh, so SNPs is sulfur nanoparticles. Uh, we're looking at fusarium and tomato in this study, foliar application, seed treatment, you know, the, the usual approach that we that that we that I've been talking about. Uh, so here is uh, biomass. So the black bars are the foliar, the uh, red bars are the seed treatment. Uh, so healthy controls here. Here's your disease control. So significant reduction in both root and 
root biomass is below the bar, shoot is above. And what you see is these, these applications of nanoscale sulfur are significantly increasing biomass. Down here is the time-dependent disease data uh, that you're getting a significant suppression of disease uh, with this application. Uh, so decreasing disease by 48%, increasing by biomass by up to 56. And in this case, um, we used uh, high mexazole, which is a commercially uh, available fungicide for fusarium on tomato. And we out, we outperformed it. And again, maybe this is something that I should be focusing on more. Uh, but in all of these field studies, you know, there's no other conventional pesticide treatment. It's just our nanoscale nutrients that, um, you know, these foliar applications that we're using. Uh, and, and in this case, we're outperforming uh, commercial material. Uh, so we did uh, a little bit of uh, uh, molecular biology, uh, gene expression analysis, uh, not, not as much as we could have done, but, um, you know, th these are similar pathways to what you see activated with copper, but slightly different because we're working with sulfur. So we've got the silicic acid pathway um, and then uh, some of the antioxidant pathways. But again, the key point is many of them are significantly upregulated in the presence of our nanoscale treatment, whether it's foliar or, or, or seed treatment. And again, we do find some of these uh, nanoparticles in the stems. So we are probably also getting some direct antimicrobial activity, uh, but that's, that's not the driver of, of what we're seeing here. So again, this, this really got us interested in, in uh, nanoscale sulfur as a nutrient. And, and one of the things I should have mentioned is that the interesting thing about sulfur, um, 30 years ago, nobody, nobody cared about sulfur in soil because of uh, the, the burning of uh, high sulfur containing fossil fuels. There was plenty of sulfur in the atmosphere that was coming down as uh, in the form of precipitation. Uh, but with the Clean Air Act, um, you know, that, that's changed. And actually in the last five to 10 years, many growers have started to see sulfur deficiencies in their crops. So it's become fairly common to have to add sulfur to soil as a nutrient now, uh, which is an interesting uh, thing to think about. But this, this was our first um, uh, experiment with nanoscale sulfur. Uh, my postdoc, who's still with me, Yi, she ran two greenhouse studies in a field experiment, which we initially envisioned as one big paper, but now because the data is so good, it's actually going to be three papers. Uh, so we'll focus on the greenhouse study first. Um, and, and she really, um, you know, went, went with a large number of endpoints. We're looking at disease progress, biomass, yield for the field study, pigment production, tissue, tissue nutrient content by ACPMS. Uh, we did gene expression analysis, but we also did the metabolomic profile of the leaves by LCMS. Uh, we did two, uh, two photon microscopy, and then we looked at the, the impact on the microbiome. Uh, in the rhizosphere. So here's the disease data from the greenhouse study. Uh, there's your healthy, um, there's your disease control. Uh, our two nano sulfurs, we did two doses down here. They really did an excellent job at suppressing disease. And you kind of see that in these pictures up here. Uh, and we also looked at a coated sulfur material that was coated with stearic acid. They both did really well. The interesting thing is bulk sulfur does do an okay job um, and, and ionics sulfur to a lesser extent. But what you see with bulk and ionic sulfur is a much greater likelihood of acidifying the soil, uh, which, is, which is problematic. And I also should mention uh, that this, uh, this was a soil application, not a foliar application. We're doing the foliar stuff now. Um, and then here is your, uh, and, and, and the other thing that we did was a time. So all of these endpoints we collected uh, in, in time dependent fashion at four, eight and 16 days, we were harvesting uh, plants and doing this analysis. Uh, so uh, I should update this. The transcriptomic and metabolo metabolomic analyses are actually done. This paper is uh, under review right now uh, at ACS Nano, sorry, not Nature Nano. Uh, and similar to the previous study, except looking at a greater number of genes, uh, many of these, uh, these pathways are being upregulated. But the interesting thing is because we did a time-dependent study, we see all of the increases in gene expression at the eight-day uh, time period, and then those genes start to start to come down. But then that's when the metabolites actually start to come up at 16 days. So you see that transcription and translation uh, action really uh, very clearly. 
So that's the first greenhouse study that's under review. We're working on a field paper right now. Uh, in fact, as soon as I'm done, I'm gonna go work on that paper some more. Uh, and what we noticed here, uh, and again, here's this is a field study and we're measuring actual yield of tomato. Uh, what we saw was uh, the increase in early yield in the healthy plants was 18%, uh, which was $33 investment increase in food production, $6,700 per acre. But in the, in the fungal treatments, uh, our increase in early year yield was 54%. Uh, so a $33 investment, you know, producing $12,000 uh, per acre more of tomato. So think of it in terms of food production. Um, so everything up until now has been on fungal pathogens of plants. Uh, our group just got a new grant that was funded July, uh, sorry, January 1st of this year to look at viruses. Uh, and one of the things that you can do with viruses is you can maximize plants innate ability to defend themselves. Uh, and that's some, through a pathway called RNA interference. Uh, so when a plant detects foreign DNA in its system, uh, in its tissues, it will produce uh, naturally occurring enzymes to chop up that, that DNA. That's, uh, that's what RNA interference is. And you can actually stimulate that response. You can supply foreign DNA to the plant and, and trigger that response. But the problem is DNA is very unstable. Uh, so within four or five days, if you're stimulating that response, you, you lose the effect. So in this proposal, what we actually chose to do was to take um, the, the double-stranded RNA, which is your you know, your trigger to try and stimulate plant defense. And we're putting it inside different nanomaterials, carbon dots, mesopores, silica, things like that, so that we can get those materials into the plants and then they can release that DNA, or that double-stranded RNA over a longer period of time to, to get this prolonged ability of the plant to defend itself. So this is, this is really almost like a vaccination if you wanna think about it that way, um, because you're prophylactically uh, enabling the plant to defend itself against viruses. And plant viruses are like viruses of humans. They're much more difficult to, to, to treat than, uh, than some other pathogens. So everything up until now was biotic stress from pathogens. We're also working on some abiotic stress because one of the things we know is that with a change in climate, we're gonna have to grow crops under more marginal conditions. So we're gonna have to see uh, crops dealing with stresses such as temperature, drought, uh, and salinity. Uh, so in this case, uh, Chris Dimka uh, runs our analytical chemistry department. He's been with us for about two years. He's been looking at uh, drought. Uh, and uh, nanoscale zinc. So this is a paper we published in 2019 where we were adding zinc to soil because we had reasons to think this might work. Uh, uh, and in this case, this was uh, sorghum. So what you see over here is yield, nitrogen, and potassium. Uh, these are the, the, the controls and the D control in this, in this case, D is not disease, it's drought. Um, but in the drought control, obviously you see reductions in yield and nutrient content. But what you see is these amendments of zinc to the soil are actually, and these are, these are low concentrations, one, three, and five PPM zinc. Um, you're getting significant uh, alleviation of some of the, some of the drought stress. And, and Chris actually just got a big NSF grant to, to look at this a little further. Uh, and uh, actually, this is the data that led uh, led to the grant uh, because he was uh, taking classic, you know, traditional urea nanoparticles, and he was actually coating them with nanoscale zinc in different forms, and looking at that as a foliar amendment in, in, in terms of the plant's ability to respond to drought. And he was seeing very similar effects uh, to the previous study, um, but you know, he has a much more effective carrier for getting this in in this case because he's using the conventional zinc nanoparticles. Um, salinity is another, another uh, issue uh, that crops will have to deal with. And in this case, uh, this was a seed treatment that was done within the center for sustainable nano. Uh, in this case, we used cotton because um, that's not a food crop, but the, the group are, was working on this for, for different reasons. Uh, but in this case, it was a, a coating of uh, 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 cerium oxide that was coated uh, with an organic uh, compound. Uh, and then these, these seeds were germinated under different degrees of stress. And, and uh, as you might expect, um, you know, we see a significant increase in germination. And this is a, a function of cerium 
actually probably serving as both an antioxidant and, and a plant hormone uh, because, um, you know, cerium is interesting because it's actually not a nutrient. Plants do not require it, but when you supply it, they tend to do better. Uh, and again, that's because it's a natural antioxidant, but it also mimics uh, the activity of some hormones. Uh, and we were able to uh, confirm some of that activity with uh, some gene expression analysis of these plants. Um, so we do have a couple of other things that we're investigating that are separate from biotic and abiotic stress. Uh, if you really want to tackle agricultural problems, and, and maybe I should have mentioned this from the beginning, but there, there is no, there are very few human activities that have a more negative impact on the environment than agriculture. Um, and one of the biggest issues is nitrogen and phosphorus use. Uh, and so we do have a, a USDA project that was just funded last year um, where uh, the issue with phosphorus obviously is loss. Um, so, you know, growers are supplying phosphorus, but massive quantities of that phosphorus are lost from the system. They're not delivered to the plant. So our approach was to take that all of that phosphorus that's needed and actually put it into biodegradable polymers, biopolymers. Uh, so then that, and, and uh, we could grind that up to a powder and add it to the soil. And then that phosphorus is only going to be released from that polymer as that polymer is degraded. And again, we can do this tunably. We can control the polymers to control the release of phosphorus. Uh, so this is the first data from that grant uh, was published at the end of 2021. Uh, so this was a greenhouse study with tomato. We took it to, to yield 150 days. Uh, and we, we measured a whole range of different endpoints and essentially showed that, you know, when you add phosphorus by our new, new system using these nanoscale biopolymers, you get, you get equivalent fruit. Uh, but this is the amount of phosphorus that's lost from the soil. We, we collected it as leachate, so it's not really runoff, but it's our model of runoff. So this is the amount of phosphorus lost from conventional phosphorus treatments. This is the amount of phosphorus that's lost when we put it in this nanoscale biopolymer. Uh, so you're decreasing phosphorus loss by 90%. Uh, and this is actually suggesting that it's actually still all in the soil. So depending on how available it is, you know, this could imply that you actually can add a, a lot less phosphorus than you're actually, um, you know, conventionally going to do. So some of the other things that we're looking at, and I'll, I'll try and finish up because I know I'm bumping up against my time limit. Uh, one of the things is uh, enhancing photosynthesis. Many of these nanoscale micronutrients either have semiconducting ability or there are reasons to think that they could impact electron flow uh, as through, through photosynthesis. Uh, so to look at that, this was a, a study done with Nanjing University, my collaborator there, uh, Li Zhang Zhao. Uh, and um, here we actually wanted to come up with a high throughput system to start testing these materials. So we started working with spinach uh, mesophyll, uh, leaf mesophyll protoplasts. Uh, and this is kind of just a demonstration of efficacy of the approach. We looked at different um, metal oxide micronutrients. Uh, and what you see here is, uh, uh, so this is quantum yield photosynthetic efficiency. The black bar is the control. And what you see is the manganese and the iron are actually giving you greater um, greater quantum yield. Uh, and we had some, you know, our negative control was uh, we silver nanoparticles to make sure we could see toxicity. Uh, so you can measure this in any, any number of ways. You can look at ATP production, carbon fixation, so forth and so on. Uh, and, you know, what we showed was that with the iron and the manganese, we're actually seeing increases in these. Uh, and, you know, we are seeing some toxicity from our silver as, as anticipated. Uh, Lijuan did some, some, uh, uh, gene expression uh, and metabolite analysis, but I don't have time to go through that. Uh, and then obviously what you have to do, since this was a protoplast study, you got to confirm what you're seeing in a whole plant, which is what we did. So we're actually preparing a, a large USDA grant for submission in August to specifically look at this issue. Uh, and then this is the most recent study. This was published uh, just last year in ACS Nano. And this is actually the study that triggered the USDA grant that we're going to put in because one of the things we started thinking about was, well, if we can kind of stimulate the carbon fixation and carbon cycling pathway, maybe we could do the same thing at the same time with nitrogen, because if carbon cycling in a plant is increasing, and that's a plant that's a nitrogen fixer, um, that could simultaneously increase nitrogen 
cycling in the plant because the plant will have to maintain that carbon nitrogen balance. Uh, so we did this with a single cell organism initially, which was cyanobacteria. But sure enough, we did see that all of that upreg upregulation of the Calvin cycle led to uh, an increase in nitrogen fixation in the cyanobacteria just to keep up with the carbon. Uh, so obviously, we want to look at this in, in some leguminous plants, maybe even some non leguminous ones, depending on, uh, you know, the system we're looking at. So what's the technological readiness of all of this? So this is a paper we published in 2020 from a workshop that we held that the, the key question for the workshop, uh, it was at McGill, was, you know, we think nano-enabled agriculture can have a big impact, but what are the, what are the barriers? Uh, so we did a couple of things. Uh, we identified three barriers here, notably two of which have nothing to do with the science. And then we um, came up with ways to get over those barriers. So. Uh, you know, that's an interesting to look, thing to look at at this paper. But we also ranked all of the possible approaches that we could think of, both in terms of performance and readiness. Um, so this is a really interesting paper. It was published in the first issue of Nature Food. Uh, and um, this is a paper that's actually the, uh, on the, the current issue of Nature Nanotechnology. We got the cover. This is a paper. Um, most of the authors actually worked at EPA, US EPA. Uh, and we did a meta-analysis of um, 36,000 Google patents, 500 peer review papers, uh, looking specifically at nanopesticides. Uh, so this is a really interesting study. Uh, and what we showed overall, uh, and the postdoc that did this is now actually a faculty member um, at Auburn, um, Kevin, was on average, we were getting increased activity against the target organism of 31%, including almost 19% in field trials. So, you know, more activity against the pathogen in nanoscale form. Uh, but what's interesting is we're also getting some secondary benefits. Toxicity towards the non-target non organism when, you're, when your pesticide is in nanoscale form is decreased. Uh, premature degradation or loss from the systems both decreased. And then you can get all of these other benefits by tuning the chemistry. Um, so, um, you know, this, this paper really kind of lays out all of the potential benefits you have from, the, from these types of approaches. Uh, and again, we got the cover, which was very exciting. Uh, so I'll finish here uh, with some conclusions after this, but this obviously has become a major area of, of research in, in my group and, and the, the groups we're collaborating with, including four new grants uh, recently. Uh, but this concept of sustainability is really important to us. Uh, and, uh, you know, the approach, the approach we're taking is if you can't increase food production with a strategy that's safe and sustainable, then you shouldn't be doing it. Uh, and uh, we demonstrated this in three of our recent studies. These are three studies where we used an approach that actually conveyed some sort of benefit to the plant. Uh, and I'll leave it to you to look in the papers and see what those benefits were, but it was working in some, to some extent. But because of the endpoints we measure and because of this concept of, uh, you know, we have to be sustainable, uh, what we actually noticed was kind of unintended or secondary negative consequences, either in the rhizosphere or the plant endophytes. Uh, and, you know, maybe one growing season, it's not going to be that big of a deal. Uh, but over time, um, you know, these, these types of secondary impacts are going to be, are going to be significant and they're going to be negative. Uh, so these would be approaches that we would argue sh we should not pursue, even if, even if it's benefiting the plant, there are other things going on that, that's going to compromise, uh, you know, what we're trying to do. Uh, so in conclusion, hopefully I've, I've convinced you that, uh, you know, nanotechnology does have significant potential. Global food insecurity is a problem that's only going to get worse. And we've seen that just in the last, you know, four or five months with what's going on in, in uh, Ukraine uh, with Russia and, and food production that, that's uh, kind of been derailed. Um, so these, these materials can act at a whole range of different levels in terms of uh, agricultural production. Uh, and we're only looking at some of the pieces here. There are obviously many different ways to look at this. But this concept, concept of safety and sustainability is critical. And the only reason, the only way you can know if you're safe and sustainable is if you understand your mechanism of action. So you really have to, to take that approach. Uh, so obviously we have a large number of collaborators, both in the US and globally. I'd like to you know, take this opportunity today to kind of uh, increase that list of collaborators because the number of questions that I think we can address 
here are, are significant. And um, you know, the more the more people that are working on this, the better. Um, these are these are documents that come out of the White House. Uh, they're supplemental budget requests for the National Nanotechnology Initiative, which is how nanotechnology research is funded in the U.S. across 26 different funding agencies. Uh, and in the 2019 and 2020 versions, our, our work was actually highlighted, which is which was also pretty exciting. Uh, so I think I went a couple of minutes long, but hopefully that's okay. Uh, so I'll stop sharing now and be happy to take some questions. Thank you so much, Jason. That was really a fascinating talk with uh, an enormous amount of promise in the sort of work that you're doing. And uh, speaking as a part-time farmer who grows tomatoes and watermelons and among other crops, uh, I, I also found some really interesting nuggets there of things that uh, I would like to follow up with you on a, on a private uh, basis. But um, uh, we have a couple of uh, questions that uh, have been asked already on the chat uh, from Ian Oliver uh, in the UK. A great talk, thank you. Would it help with the regulatory aspects if some more tests were done showing no negative effects from the treatment on soil micro sorry, so, soil microbial functions and soil microbial species composition or on earthworms. I'd love to do some work on that. And uh, Ian has uh, turned on his camera. I, I'd invite all of you to turn on your cameras if you want to. Uh, hi, Ian. I, I, yes, absolutely. I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, uh, very few groups. There, there, there's a fair number of groups now that are that are, you know, trying to use nanotechnology to some benefit for plants. Uh, but those three studies where we actually just looked at the endophytes of the microbiome um, were really one, you know, the, a very small number of studies are doing that, looking at, at secondary receptors. So, you know, doing some of the approaches that we have in a more complex microcosm system where you have earthworms or you look more broadly at what's going on, I, I think that would be really important. Um, you know, the, the regulatory community in the U.S. is, is kind of scratching their head with nano-enabled agriculture. I mean, some of these products are actually all, already on the market in the U.S. Um, because there's no labeling requirements and EPA has no size other than for sulfur or excuse me, other than for silver. They have no size specific regulatory framework. Uh, so it's very much on a case by case basis. Um, COSIDE 3000, which is the most common copper hydroxide fungicide that's used in, in the U.S. as, as an organic product, is a, is a nanoscale form. Um, but in terms of the market, um, you know, it's, it's probably less than 5% of agrochemicals are in nanoscale at the U.S., maybe less than 1%. Uh, and that's largely because of regulatory uncertainty. We're talking to multiple companies, and, and they love our data. Uh, but the one thing that immediately comes up is regulatory uncertainty. They are reluctant, they being the agrochemical companies, are reluctant to commit significant resources to this until they have some sort of understanding of how regulatory acceptance is going to go. And that's completely separate from consumer acceptance. I mean, that's another issue. Um, but uh, so I, I think the, the more data you we can generate and and just you know I, I sometimes i present a graph in terms of the number of publications and you know it's it's an exponential growth curve just over the last five years if my h index only looked like that growth curve i mean geez um, the number of publications coming out is is really dramatically increasing uh, and if we can really get some solid data out there uh, you know both ecologically and environmental toxicology in that realm i think i think that would be really important thank you that's great uh, thank you, Jason. We also have a question from someone at uh, Shanghai Jiao Tong. Um, I'm sorry, uh, in the chat, all I get is uh, SJTU. Um, thank you for your speech. Combined with my study, I have a question. Why did low concentration of nanoceria, uh, and I'll let you, Jason, read the details of that, okay. cause more dramatic changes of differential change genes and related functional pathways than the higher concentration of the nanoceria? Yeah, that's a good question, and we see that sometimes. And and um, you know, I'm I'm an environmental toxicologist, which means I spend most of the time running around telling the biologists I'm a chemist and the chemist that I'm a biologist. But this this is a chemistry question. What you see is sometimes these higher concentrations of materials uh, they will do what nanomaterials tend to do, which is aggregate. Uh, and um, in in that case, that I think I believe that's what happened here. So the coating was enough to at a lower concentration, keep the materials dispersed, giving us our nanoscale effects. 
but at a higher concentration, you lose that battle. And these nanoscale materials aggregate, they no longer become nanoscale materials, they become much more inert and ineffective. Uh, and I'm trying to remember the specifics because this was done at Riverside by a colleague of mine, but I'm almost positive that that was, that was what we, he saw. And we've seen that in other studies where if you get that, that material aggregation, either on the leaf surface or even in you know, pre-application, you, you lose a lot of that benefit. And that again highlights the fact that the, the benefit is at the nanoscale. Uh, and some of that we understand and a lot of it we don't. Um, you know, fundamentally we're putting these materials on the leaf surface and tracking it by ICP and we're doing some microscopy and stuff. But this is an incredibly dynamic process as these nutrients are moving into the plant from one compartment to the next. And you almost have to watch in real time because I, you know, you could be getting dissolution and then uh, reduction again to particles. You're getting a corona forming. You're getting a corona degrading and changing over time. Um, so it's an exceptionally dynamic process. But the chemistry of the material at the beginning is really, really important. Uh, and I, I, that's that's what was going on in that study. Maybe I'll take my. Uh... Host's prerogative and ask a question here. Um, early on in your talk, you were talking about uh, some of the copper nanoparticle work and where you found uh, quite an enhancement when you went to the uh, copper phosphate nano sheets. And I was wondering uh, whether the phosphate in there is uh, an important part of the mechanism that you're seeing, or is it simply a structural response? So you must have been one of the reviewers on our first paper because <laughs> we submitted it. We didn't have the phosphorus control initially, but we re-ran re it. Um, we, when we looked at it, the, the amount of phosphorus we were adding was not um, significant, was not enough to have a significant impact as a phosphorus nutrient. Um, and, and we did con confirm that. I didn't, I didn't put that data up. Um, so what was happening there was, was two things. One, um, the, it, the fact that it was a nano sheet, we, we now have microscopy data showing that when your nanomaterial is in sheet form, these things lay very nicely on the leaf surface. And then they become a continual source of, of ions over time of release. And again, it's a slow release, but it's a release that can be controlled. We could coat that copper phosphate with something to modulate how quickly that release goes. What tends to happen with the materials that are not sheets is they sit there as little nano boulders or you know something else, and, or they aggregate over time, uh, you know, as the moisture content on the leaf increases and decreases, and and um, you know it could just be a function of surface area. With those sheets, they just you get you get much more surface area that can slowly release those ions, because those sheets, I mean, they're they're ten or twelve nanometers thick, but they're six or 700, 800 nanometers long. I really can't envision a lot of those nano sheets actually moving through stomata and entering the plant. I really think in that case, it's just a sustained release of ions that you have, you know, very locally, either microscopically or, or you know, at the nano scale, just, just supplying that plant with what it needs. Whereas these conventional forms, the salt, for whatever reason, they're getting stuck in the cuticle. We think they're getting bound up with organic molecules there, um, uh, or they're just washing off. Uh, when it rains or, you know, humidity increases or something like that. Great, thank you. Uh, other questions for Jason? Either uh, put them on the chat or feel free to open your microphone and ask the questions. I'm going to put my email in the chat too. So, I mean, if anybody wants to talk about the, you know, things more offline or initiate a collaboration, you know, I would certainly love to do that. And my email is easy enough. It's just jason.white at ct.gov. Yes, I'm sure that would be helpful to people. Um, <clears throat> I have another question for you, and it comes back to the seed uh, treatment uh, approach. And this sort of follows up on uh, your answer to uh, Ian Oliver's uh, question. But um, for, for seed treatments, do you see this ultimately as something that would be done by the seed producers or by the growers themselves? And um, just wondering about, because so much of the seed, it's, it's actually kind of hard to buy untreated seed these days, you know, uh, a, a lot of the seed has some sort of treatment on it already. Would you see this as being uh, incompatible with, with uh, treatments? I mean, a lot, obviously a lot of the seed treatment is fungal anyway, so you might not need that with uh, some of the things that you're using, but, uh, uh, you know, just wondering how, how you see this playing out vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the seed companies. Yeah, I, I think the ideal situation is the seed company is going to do it and uh, because we, we talk to growers all the time. I mean, that's one of the benefits of being a state agency. I mean, we're 
constantly interacting with growers and, and growers don't want to do anything um, to, uh, you know, increase labor or, and, and then you have an exposure issue if they're handling the materials themselves. So it would definitely be much easier if, um, you know, if, this, if the seed companies were to do this directly. Um, and the other, the other, I mean, one of the, one of the strategies we identified in that paper in terms of overcoming uh, barriers uh, was regulatory agencies are concerned about risk. Uh, and the amount of nanoscale materials you're going to use in a seed coating is even dramatically less than you'd use as a foliar application to a seedling, which is dramatically less than conventional. So I, I think that's one way to go. Um, and um, because just, just as a function of less risk, I think you're much more likely to get acceptance. Um, I mean, a couple of other things that I, that I should have mentioned. I mean, the one thing I like about our approach is we're using nutrients. I mean, there are groups out there that are using carbon nanotubes and, and silver and, you know, different forms of gold that are activated in one way or another. None of those materials are nutrients. I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm not particularly fond of eating carbon nanotubes in my apple, um, you know, whether it's of actual risk or not. But, you know, copper, silicon, you know, even cerium, these, these are metabolically active materials and they are not going to be in nanoscale form in the plant. They're just not because they're going to be metabolized. They're going to be utilized. Uh, and the amount of material that we're adding is, is really quite low because of our treatment of, uh, you know, the seedlings. And that works in New England because much of uh, agriculture in New England is you start the seedlings in the greenhouse and then you transplant in the field. That's actually why we came up with this approach. If you're talking about soybean in Minnesota or wheat, that's where the seed treatments are going to come in because it's just a different approach. I'm looking at my email. I actually typed my own email wrong. So I'm going to redo that. It's jason.white at ct.gov. Sorry about that. I was typing too fast. Well, it is early in the morning here in the uh, East Coast of North America. Uh, any other questions for uh, Jason today? Maybe if, uh, just giving people one last chance to think about that. I'll just um, uh, mention that uh, next week's uh, talk will be from Greg Lowry uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. And Greg will be uh, in some ways following up on some of the things that uh, Jason's been talking about today. And we'll be looking at some of the dynamics of nanoparticles in soils and soil systems. So I hope you will all join us uh, for that. And. Uh, once more, just uh, any last questions for Jason? Can I ask just one quick one? Sure. Absolutely. Um, if the, your seedlings are treated and then they're put out in the field, has there been any calculations done on what happens with the, the, the additions into the soil? Um, have you shown that it's really low or is it sort of uh, assumptions that it's really low? Um, for us, it's been, um, for the most part, an assumption. But what, what we would do was we, you know, we would compare it to the amount of copper that a conventional grower would actually be adding. And in that case, it's, it's far less or the amount of pesticide that a grower would be adding. One of the things that Greg will show you next week, Greg's actually a really good friend of mine. And, you know, he's, he's an excellent scientist. He's got data, um, not to steal his thunder, but he's, he has shown that actually, uh, and he did this with gold so he could track it. But um, nanoscale gold, when it was a uh, foliar application, he could measure gold being exuded from the roots of plants. Um, so, uh, and that goes back to my statement about this is an extremely dynamic process and we understand relatively little about what's going on which is why i think we should not be using things like nanotubes and you know fullerenes and things like that which are very good carriers i mean they're excellent carriers but you know uh, until we start answering some more questions i'm much more comfortable dealing with things that we know the plant needs and will actively metabolize and use so that it most likely will not be in nanoscale form Thanks very much. I'm going to start working on a grant application. <laughs> Happy to be an international uh, unfunded collaborator. <laughs> Terrific. Thanks very much. Sounds like a good plan, Ian. <clears throat> well, with that, um, let me once again thank you, Jason. That was a really excellent talk, and you've uh, uh, opened our eyes to a lot of different areas for uh, future research. Uh, I do hope that there will be some collaborations that come out of your uh, talk today. Um, it's certainly an area that's of vital interest to many of the members of the IIES. So thank you for taking the time from your very busy schedule, and we really appreciate your talk.
My pleasure. Thank you. And thank you all the rest of you for joining us. Um, remember to join us next week for our talk and uh, have a good and safe week. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Bye,